Have you ever wondered what it is like to have magical abilities? You probably have. I know I have. But what if you didn't know you had them? And then suddenly, your life changes. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Friday Fantasy Show from the Bottled Imp, exploring the realms of fantasy. My name is Ken Boyter and today we take a look at Wizard of Earthsea. Yes, this is the two-part adaptation of the Ursula K. Le Guin novels. So she wrote, I think there's five in the series. And this is what this is based on. This is made, it was made for TV. So, you know, sometimes they're hit and miss, who knows. And this was way back in 2004. It's directed by Robert Liberman. And it was commissioned, I believe, or at least it was shown on the Sci-Fi Channel. So as I say, TV movies, are they any good? Well, let's find out if this one is. <laughs> what is the setup of Wizard of Earthsea? Well, there's a few things going on. King Tygath wants to rule all of the, I think there's a thousand odd, or at least in the hundreds, of little tiny islands that make up Earthsea. Meanwhile, a young lad named Ged, who lives in a small village, is having visions about a girl and who is opening doors. Yeah, it's a strange vision, but that's what he's having. Now, King Tygath also wants to release the Nameless Ones, who are demons from whom King Tygath hopes to learn the secret of immortality. Yes, that's what he's after. So he's not asking much, is he? Now, Ged's village comes under attack from King Tygath as he believes a prophecy that a great wizard will destroy him. And he believes that, that wizard in Ged's, is in Ged's village. Now, you might be hearing some horrible noises in the background as we talk. But don't worry, fear not. That is improvements to Imp Towers. Yes, we're having a dragon platform put on the top of Imp Towers because we want to attract some dragons. We love dragons. But we will carry on, nevertheless. So, there's a prophecy. The King Tigrath fears that he is going to be destroyed by this wizard, and he believes that the wizard is hanging out in the village that Ged is at. Now, he doesn't know who this wizard is, but he believes the wizard is going to destroy him, so he must wipe him out at all costs. Well, you would do that, wouldn't you? It's a prophecy. It can't be wrong. It's real. Anyway, Gad manages to cast a spell and saves the village. Well, for now. A Magnus arrives at the village to train Ged. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm not going to give any too many spoilers away because, you know, there are obviously things that do go wrong. I'm going to talk about the themes within this uh, mini-series. Conquest. Conquest is one of the themes, as you probably could tell from the setup. Royal Monarch wants to unite all the islands, and he sees it as a positive thing. Or he tries to sell it as a positive thing anyway. But really, it would just mean enslavement of, and the erosion of many different cultures and traditions all across the islands. They're all independent, and they all seem to be getting on with each other. There doesn't seem to be any hint of previous wars or anything like that. So it's just basically one person's will and dominance over the many. He want, he's, so the intention is false, the intention is wrong. It's coming from an evil place. It's not coming from a good place. It's not saying, do you know what? If we unite, then we can withstand any invaders that come from the outside, or we can you know, have better trade deals or anything like that. No, no, no. It's not a good intention. It's a bad intention. It's nothing to do with improving the general populace and, and their lives. Then we have true identity. What is identity? What is it that makes a person a person? Is it your profession, you know, your job? Is it what you do? Is it your deeds? Is it your thoughts? Is it your actions? Is it your name? You know, what's in a name? Is it the nature of you? Is it your morals? Is it your beliefs, your codes? Is it your culture, where you're from? What is it that actually is your identity? And do you know thyself? There's that expression, know thyself. Well, do you really ever know yourself? But there's also, it's not necessarily that you're just fixed as one person identity and one person you, know, you are made up of lots of different things and these things do constantly keep changing 
they can change throughout your lifetime and hopefully they will change as you learn and improve and grow as a person. So it, I always think of it it's almost like a caterpillar. It changes into a butterfly because you could say, well, the identity is the way I look. But, you know, if you're a caterpillar, you look different when you change into a butterfly. So you do have the ability to change, to improve, you know, examine who you are and possibly decide to improve it. You may love who you are, but you, you know, you have to be really honest with yourself and you might think, well, actually, you know, I was a bit grumpy, I was a bit nasty, that person, maybe I could improve and not be like that. So how does that, you know, how does your circumstances affect your identity and what is your identity? What makes up you? And also in there, in amongst all of that, there's um, stealing someone else's identity. You know, if you take on the persona of someone else's identity and you do things in their name, is it just a good excuse to kind of do evil things? You know, you can discredit someone if you try and to sort of take someone's identity. So our identity is, is sort of currency, isn't it? If you've got a good reputation, therefore you build up trust. Whereas if you've got a poor reputation, there's not a lot of trust coming your way. So your identity is actually a really important thing and it's bound up with, you know, the currency and how you interact with people. Betrayal. Betrayal is another theme. Now this one is, is there's quite a lot of secret betrayal going on, pretending to be, you know, on one side when actually you're on another side. In this case, people are pretending to be, well, they do it both. There's one person that pretends to, to be on the side of goodness, but actually they're working against goodness and they're working for evil. And also there's the reverse. There's somebody who is working for good, but they pretend to be somebody who is evil. So, you know, you've got both sides of the coin there. And betrayal is also a funny, not funny, but it, it's, it does go hand in hand with loyalty because in order to betray somebody, you've already had to be loyal to somebody. And that begs the question, why are you loyal to someone? Is it to do with money? Is it to do with fear? Is it to do with love? And I always think the best form of loyalty is love, is that love for that person or that cause. And you've got to ask, you know, are you back in the right cause? Now, you might have to change your mind because that cause goes wrong or that person goes wrong, goes off the rails. And you might feel like, well, there is actually a noble way of betraying somebody because it, it might be that they've gone, they've been corrupted themselves and, and they've changed their, you know, what, what they believe in. And, you know, is it best to stop them or could you just walk away and not betray them? You know, is it better to not betray someone, but potentially they would carry on doing damage or... Do you know I've got to stop them, I've got to betray them. So betrayal isn't always, uh, you know, a dirty thing. Peace. Peace is another thing that runs through this. So you obviously you have war and conquest. There is also then people want to want peace. You know, it, it's almost like it goes hand in hand. If there's peace, people want war. And if there's war, people want peace. So how can peace be achieved? And at what cost? Do you have to go to war in order to keep the peace? Yeah, so if you're, I guess, if you're in being invaded, do you sometimes have to go to war and be violent in order to stop violence? Is that how it works? Or is there always a diplomatic solution? Can you talk your way out? Can you negotiate to win peace? But what if the person that you're negotiating with isn't reasonable? If they're, you know, maybe they've got mental health issues and they're not reasonable, can you reason with them? You know, and, and at what point should you give up when you realise, you know, that that's not going to work and therefore you have to go to war in order to achieve peace. So again, it's a dual side, isn't it? War and peace seem to be, you know, the same, different sides of the same coin. And then there's immortality that runs through this. There is a prophecy about uh, these um, nameless ones that know, that supposedly know about the immortality. So what is the fascination with immortality? Why would you want to be immortal? Is that the ultimate prize just to continue to live? I guess that all depends on whether you believe in an afterlife, because if you believe in an afterlife and you believe in a sort of an afterlife that is nurturing and loving and is a good place, then you wouldn't, well, you might be still a little bit afraid to die, but it's normally about, you know that your natural life on this earth, it comes to an end and you'd cross over and you'd be hopefully in a nurturing place, in a loving place, and therefore you wouldn't need an immortality. But that is a form of immortality because your soul lives on. So this prophecy is, also, is just talking about the same state as in a physical body and you're the same person and your soul is the same and you have immortality and then that doesn't change. Is it justified to, to sin in the pursuit of it? 
does the end justify the means or the means justify the end? I can't remember which way around that is. Is it one of those things where, oh, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm going for immortality. Do you get corrupt along the way? Do you throw your morals out of the way? I guess it's like if you're lusting after money, you know, how do you, do, do you square it if you're being cruel to people, but you know, it's because you're after money. So again, how much is that justified? Because immortality, you could argue is the ultimate prize. Is, is anything ever justified in that respect, you know, bad behavior? So at what price are you willing to carry on your quest for immortality? Selling your soul, is that worth it? Is that a good trade-off? So overall, well, it's always tricky, isn't it? When a book gets, or a series of books gets adapted for film or television, there's gonna be a bit of, is it as good as the books? Now, I've only read book one, and just going off of that, I would be slightly disappointed with it. Well, a bit more than slightly disappointed. It's okay. It's okay. It's not terrible. You know, the acting is pretty good. There's some really good actors in there. There's some, you know, Danny Glover, for example, he's really good. Um, there's some not so good acting in there, but on the whole, the balance of the acting is good. So you do buy into the characters, but it's not fantastic. And I, I know the source material, book one certainly, is really, really good. It's a really interesting concept. And when you adapt the source material, it's almost like why have they made the decisions that they've made? Is it because they're chasing ratings, so they're watering it down a bit more? And I think maybe that's a dangerous game to play because why do people buy the books or love the books in the first place? Because they're not watered down. So why would you water something down? The book, the book one anyway, really does concentrate on Ged. And it's his sort of inner personal journey. You know, he goes, he goes around, there's action in it, but, but it's a conflict within, in himself. It's a, it's a struggle within himself. And you can still portray that on film, and they try to do a, a job of that here. But they've brought everything in at once, and they try to make it, I think, maybe something that it's not really meant to be. They miss the subtlety and the nuance, of certainly, of the first book. And so they bring in all the politics, they bring in the wider picture, and I'm not sure that's really necessary. It's sort of almost, you know, it's very close to being a bit cliched. Luckily, there's enough original story that they've kept in from the books to make it a step above cliche, but it's close. The, some of the dialogue can be a bit cheesy. Some of it's fine, some of it's okay. It, for me, it almost would be, let's strip, let's have another rewrite, you know, let's still keep going, see if we can really tease this out and make it really, really good. When you get something like Lord of the Rings, obviously, for me, that's the benchmark, and I guess Game of Thrones now for television, that's the benchmark of what fantasy should be. So anything that kind of falls short of that, it's gonna be a bit meh. As I say, it's not terrible, it's definitely worth a watch. And if you're a fan of the books, it probably is one of those things where you just, you're just you curious to see if they've done a good job. You probably would be disappointed. But I would, you know, I'm definitely gonna read all the books. In fact, I, I had hoped to read all the books before I, I, I viewed this. But, I, but I, I try to not let the books influence my enjoyment or lack of enjoyment of, of, of a film of, you know, that's been adapted from the books, because really they should stand on their own. The opening 10 minutes is really confusing. I see what they're trying to do, they're trying to set everything up, but it's too complicated. There's, you know, the political situa situation going on. They introduce you to all these characters and they've got funny names and, you know, names that I can't pronounce anyway. So it's all a bit strange, you, you, you know. You need to latch on to something that, I, that you can identify with. And I think, for example, like um, Lord of the Rings, it's, yes, they do a backstory, but it's very simple, it's only one real story and that's about the ring so you can latch on to that and then we have the hobbits you know the shire and again i can latch into that because i know what a village is i know what it is to enjoy good food and all of that and so it gently eases you into the story it's a way in i don't feel lost with this it was all a bit too bitty and it only really got interesting when it started focused on Ged. It should have just focused on Ged from the beginning and then everything else could have been sort of a bit more in the background. The, as I say, the acting is a bit mixed bag, so you do believe Ged, but you know, I don't know, maybe he could have been a different actor, but he did a good job. I think they, a lot of the actors did a good job with the script that they had. The pacing doesn't quite work on it. It lacks a little bit of real tension here and there. 
The dialogue, as I say, is a bit clunky. On the whole, it's okay, it's passable. There are a few modern words and phrases that creep in, which for me, that's a big no-no. Um, does do a good job on the sets. There are some really lovely set pieces in there. The special effects are pretty good, you know, obviously, you know, all these productions have budgets and limits. And they did pretty well with that. I, I felt a lot of them were convincing. They did miss a chance, though, to do something really special because the book, certainly the book I've read, book one, is a bit of a classic. And it is these books are known as, as classics. They are fantasy classics. So I can imagine a lot of people would be disappointed with this. It's not amazing, but it's certainly not terrible. I would, you know, check it out. If it's on telly, definitely check it out. Is it worth buying a DVD for it? Probably, because it's it's one of those things that I feel you, sh you ought to see because it is a bit of a children's classic. And certainly if you've read the books, out of curiosity, you'd probably want to know how they've done it. So there you go, Wizard of Earthsea. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Wizard of Earthsea. Yeah, it was all right, maybe just a cut above average. You know, they could have done better. It's a shame, but check it out anyway. Thank you so much for watching. We have over 400 episodes on our YouTube channel. And if you click the subscribe bell, I think it's a bell now, you will get notified when we post new content. It's normally every Friday, but we do slip in a few imp extras now and again. Spread the word of the imp. We do have a Facebook page. Yes, go to Facebook, you can go to the page and you can really post up lots of uh, interesting articles that we don't necessarily get a chance to do episodes on. I'd love to do more episodes on various different things, but there's lots of lovely little things that we post up there, news about board games and films and books and discussions and architecture, I like architecture as well, stuff like that. There's um, archeology, span you know, interesting things, anything vaguely to do with fantasy, and definitely to do with fancy, we put up there. We've also got a fellowship, which is a Facebook group. So go type in the Bottled Imp Fellowship and click the join button, we'll add you in. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, remember to keep it unreal, especially if you're a nameless one.